Welcome to the New Church Podcast. Our text this morning is going to be from two different places. It's going to be from Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 29. So here's Exodus 20, verse, verses 4 through 6. It says, You must not make for yourself an idol out of any, of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Deuteronomy 29, 18. I'm making this covenant with you so that no one among you, no man, woman, clan, or tribe will turn away from the Lord our God to worship these gods of other nations and so that no root among you bears bitter and poisonous fruit. This is the word of the Lord. So last week was pretty amazing, guys. It was such a beautiful day for me and for my family and really for the whole church. I couldn't believe how many people showed up to help us celebrate my ordination and everything that God has started here in our church. I think it was a really cool glimpse of what this place is going to look like when we grow into the church that he's called us to be. (laughs) So I thought I'd spend a little bit of time today talking about the kind of church that God's calling us to be, all of us. So let's pray as we get started this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for New Church. We thank you for the work that you've started here, for the work that you've started in each one of us personally, the ministry that you're calling us to, that you're preparing us to do. Lord, help us to listen and obey the things that you have for us to do. Help us to be the people that you've called us to be. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we're all here this morning, all of us, to worship God. Sunday morning. Start our week by offering the first part of the first day to the Lord. To give it back to him a sacrifice of praise to show that we intend to give him the rest of our week too, to show that we're thankful for everything that he's given us and that it's our intention to use everything that he's given us faithfully as his people, that we're blessed to be a blessing, that we give glory to God for the blessing of the world. Basically, that everything we have belongs to God, guys, and we want to be faithful in what we do with it. All of it. So here's a really bold statement. See what you think of this. Anything that we don't offer back to God, anything we don't handle the way he wants us to, is an offering that we're making to a false god. I'll bet, I, I'll bet if I asked you what your favorite false gods to worship are, you'd probably be like, I don't worship false gods. I'm a Christian. I worship Jesus, right? I mean, I don't think there'd be very many of us here who'd be like, well, 
Sometimes I like to worship the devil, but it's so hard to get the pentagram stains out of the carpet, all that goat blood, it's a mess. No, the idols of Katy, Texas, they're much more subtle than that. The devil hides behind pleasure and our possessions. He's sneaky like that in the way we get all wrapped up in our positions at work, our status in the community, or with our friends or our kids. See, in Katy, Texas, the devil is perfectly happy to let us make our sacrifices to the worship of self, that unholy trinity of sex, money, and our bellies. So your favorite false god to worship, it's probably the same as mine. It's that guy who grabs everything God gives me and tries to keep it for himself. That person who keeps looking back at me when I look into the mirror. See, God gives us good things. But we get those things all twisted and tangled up in our heart. We hold on to those things too tight and we distort them into something bad. I mean, anything that God gives us, it can be a wonderful and beautiful thing if we use it the way he intends us to use it. Or that same thing, the very same thing, can rot in our soul and make us miserable if we misuse it. I mean, like, like a hammer, just a hammer. I mean, a hammer is a great tool for pounding nails into a board. I mean, it's great. You can build a house, you can hang a picture, you can fix a fence. But you can also hit yourself in the head or like knock your teeth out with it. I don't know why you'd want to pound yourself in the face with a hammer, but, but we do it with other things all the time, don't we? I mean, like food. Food is a great thing. It's a great gift. We can't live without it. But we eat cheeseburgers and ice cream until we give ourselves heart disease, diabetes. Might as well be a hammer to the face. Sex is a good thing, it's a great thing. But we wanna do whatever we want with whoever we want. We don't want God telling us what to do. We're so obsessed with sex and skin and porn, that we're willing to risk our most important relationships for that stupid little thrill we get from clicking and searching for nasty delights. Might as well be a hammer to the face. Money's a good thing, but we're stingy and foolish. We waste it on frivolous things and distractions, spend most of it before we even earn it, might as well be a hammer to the face. Same with time. I mean, God gives every one of us 24 hours a day, and we're either going to use that time the way he wants us to use it, which would be good for us, which would be a blessing for everyone we know or we're gonna waste that time. We're gonna spend it frivolously, mostly looking for distractions. Might as well be hitting ourselves in the face with a hammer, pounding out a graven image of ourself with the gold that God has given us. Remember what it said, you must not make yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. 
You must not bow down to those things or worship those things. Because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. See, it's not a matter of whether we're going to worship or not. It's a matter of what we're going to worship. Because we're all going to worship something. Since the beginning of time, every culture that has ever existed has had religion, worship. There's no escaping it, guys. Man is a spiritual creature, a worshiper. In the heart of every person is the knowledge that they're a creature. They were created. There's a creator. Pascal, he said that there's a God-shaped vacuum, a God-shaped hole inside every person. And we're going to fill that up with something. We're going to worship something. Whatever our heart clings to, whatever we confide in, whatever we trust more than anything else, whatever we're afraid of, that's our God. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, it talks about how dangerous it is to love the world. See, when we love the world, when we love things, we don't have the love of God in us. It talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I used to know this old preacher who said, God wants his people to have nice things, but he doesn't want those nice things to have his people. See, we're supposed to love God, not the things he gives us. See, the only way to do that is to offer them back to him. There was this art teacher, and she taught little kids how to paint. Her classroom was always covered with the most amazing, colorful, brilliant paintings. And someone asked her one time, how did you teach these little kids to paint so well? And she said, the trick is to take it away from them before they ruin it. See, we're either going to worship God by using all the things he gives us the way he wants us to, by offering them back to him, or we're going to smear our life into a big, brown, gross, nasty mess. And instead of offering those things to God, we offer them to ourselves. You know, I said every culture has some kind of religion, But not all religions lead to God. There's a man who lives in the Katy area. He's not particularly self-aware. I mean, he works really hard. He's got a really nice house, a wife, and a family. His weekends are busy with sports and kids, getting the yard work done. He loves his yard. I mean, it's got to be just right. He's got all the right tools. He keeps them clean and organized. He takes a lot of pride in his place. I call him lawnmower guy. Lawnmower guy is not opposed to going to church, but it's also not really a priority. But then one day, for some reason, he shows up here at New Church I mean, think about it. What's that going to be like for him? What's he going to hear? What's he going to see? How are we going to treat him? And here's the real question. Is it going to seem like a good use of his day off to be here? He's married to a really great woman. 
she's a great mom. I mean, she works really hard, too. And she not only holds everything together at home, but she knows about what's going on in the world. She's very concerned about all the news headlines, all the issues. She worries about what kind of world her kids are going to inherit. Miss socially conscious supermom thinks of herself as spiritual, but she hasn't really pushed the idea of getting her family to church. She's not really sure it's that important, to be honest. But again, one Sunday, for some reason, she's here. She might be here this morning. What kind of impression is she going to get from what goes on here? Is she going to feel like we're judging her? Welcoming her? How are we going to make her feel? See, I want New Church to be a place that lawnmower guy and Miss Socially Conscious Supermom can walk into on a Sunday morning and they can start to understand what God's love and grace are all about. See, I want them to know that the connection that they're longing for with the deepest part of their soul, that can only be found in Jesus, in worshiping God. See, I want them to experience God's love here. I want them to hear about the cross and the resurrection, eternal life. I want them to begin that lifelong process of laying everything they have, every good thing that God has given them, putting all that stuff back in His hands, letting go of all the selfish ways that they've been using their stuff and using people and offer all those things back to the Lord instead. Start understanding all those good gifts the way God intended them to be used. I want this to be a place where everyone who walks in those doors knows that Jesus came to seek and to save them. That He's real. That the life He offers is a life of meaning and purpose that they can have a future filled with hope and promise. I mean, it seems to me that people come to church looking to make sense out of their crazy lives, to get connected to God, to find meaning and purpose and direction. Is that what they're going to find when they show up here? I hope so. But I think it's going to take all of us to make that happen. We need each other. We're all in this together. We can't do this on our own. Because each one of us is going to be tempted to twist the thing that God gives us, all that stuff God gives us, to twist it into idols. We're going to be tempted to offer false worship to the false gods of our culture. All of us. So we got to stay on guard. We got to help each other. We need people to point out all the pitfalls and the blind spots, the things we can't see in our life. We've got to be reminded in the context of Christian community, we have to be reminded what God told us to do, how He wants us to live our lives how He wants us to spend our time. And we also desperately need to be reminded, as the people of God, that we're His beloved children. That He loves us. Because we're all fighting those voices in our head, telling us lies about how we're not enough. That we can't measure up. We have to remind each other constantly that Jesus tells us we're his. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. 
That's why we get together here on Sunday mornings. It's the most important thing in the world to respond to God's love, his grace, with faith. To be reminded that God not only exists, but he wants to pour blessing and reward and love and grace and hope on anyone who sincerely turns toward him. And guys, we only turn toward God because he was seeking us first. It was all his idea from the start. Saving you was his idea. It's not your idea. So I'm going to need your help to make sure that New Church is the kind of place that Lawnmower Guy and Miss Socially Conscious Supermom and anyone else who walks in those doors to make sure that it's a place where they can experience the love and the grace of God. I need you to help me spread the word about some promises. Because we promise that when people come to New Church, it's never going to be a waste of their time. Because worshiping God is never a waste of time. Giving thanks to our Creator for all the good things that He's given to us, including life and salvation. Hearing His words so we can know what to do with all the stuff He's given us, with all the days He's given us to live. That's not a waste of time. Getting together with other believers and letting them challenge us and bless us. Nothing wasted there. When we sing to God, when we sing about God, when we sing for God, we're not wasting our time. When we come here to give the first bit of each week to God, to honor Him, and to set our priorities in order, when we give Him the first portion of what He's first given us, no sacrifice that we make to the Lord is ever a waste. We also promise that worship won't be boring or fake or awkward. At least as far as it depends on us. I mean, you, you might be boring and fake and awkward. There's nothing I can do about that. But I can promise that if you show up ready to roll up your sleeves, open your heart, really pour yourself into what's happening here, if you listen and pay attention, God's going to do something in your life. This isn't some carnival sideshow. It's not a self-help seminar. This is the living God. His word never returns void. See, we're not going to pretend to be super spiritual or sell Jesus with fake plastic smiles. We're not going to drum up some emotional whoop-de-doo. It's not a circus. We're going to share the word of God in all of its challenging, provocative, comforting, life-changing glory. I mean, if you're bored, you're probably dead inside. And if you're dead inside, well, Jesus can help you with that too. Worship shouldn't be lifeless. When we worship God, we've got to do it with our whole selves. We don't leave our brain or our sense of humor or our emotions at the door. When we worship, we ought to feel it. Your heart and emotions, you ought to let them know what you're up to. So when we sing, man, we got to sing like we mean it. Put our heart into it. The music ought to rock. It should move us. I mean, what do you think music is for? It's not wallpaper. <laughs> music is the art 
of expressing human emotion with sound. So yeah, we want to feel the music. We want the music to be alive. But we all know that the sermon, the sermon is the real deal killer, right? I mean, we can pretend all we want that it's not about that, that we're bigger than that. But I've seen churches that grow, and I've seen churches that don't. And when the pastor stands up and starts talking, man, he better have something to say. So here's what we promise about the preaching at New Church. It's going to be practical, relevant. You know, there's big sections of the Bible that deal with how we're supposed to live these lives that God has given us. So we're going to talk about that stuff, what God wants us to do, what he doesn't want us to do. I mean, it really doesn't get any more practical than that, you know? What kind of husband should you be? What kind of wife should you be? Mother, father, sister, brother. How should we do our jobs? What kind of people should we be at school? How should we treat people? See, God has a lot to say about every aspect of human life. So I can promise you that the preaching here at New Church is going to be practical. Because it's going to be grounded in God's Word. I mean, sometimes it might be funny. Sometimes it might make us uncomfortable. But it's always going to be true to His Word always going to be true to the gospel. And see, these are the things that lawnmower guy is looking for. Whether he knows that or not, that's what he's looking for. Because he's looking for purpose and meaning, for a way to make sense out of his life. But these days, I think church can be kind of a hard sell to miss socially conscious Mostly because I think Christians seem to have the worst PR team in the universe. Ask anyone, and they can give you a list a mile long of the things that the church is against, the things Christians don't like. Jesus said that we would be known by our love for one another. But I think we're mostly known for being weirdos about our views on drinking and smoking and dancing and homosexuality and abortion and all kinds of other socially taboo subjects. People say, I like Jesus, I just can't stand his followers. And church gets a bad reputation. We're not known for our love. And you know, God has plenty to say about all those forbidden issues that I mentioned, all of them. There are hard things to be said about all of those things. But Jesus said that he didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He said he came to save the world. And Jesus didn't send us out into the world to stand on street corners like with big signs shouting at people, condemning the world. He didn't send us to do that either. Jesus was pretty clear. He said we're supposed to tell people that God loves them, to make disciples, baptize them, to teach them how to love each other, how to worship God. We want to get this part right, guys. This is the most important thing. So we promise that everyone who comes to New Church is going to be welcome at New Church. We're going to show them love, we're going to show them respect, and we're going to point them to the forgiveness and the mercy that Jesus has for them. And we're going to show them what that love and mercy and forgiveness looks like by the way we treat each other. We're going to forgive each other. We're going to love each other. And we're going to love people 
just the way they are when they show up. You know, God finds people where they are, not where they should have been. So we're going to do the same. We're not going to judge people as if we don't need God's grace as much as they do. See, we all get to come just as we are. We all do. Jesus calls us and we show up. That's it. Sinners that we are. But God loves us too much to leave us that way, to leave us dying in our sin. I mean, we got a lot of really bad ideas. We got a lot of bad behaviors that we got to get out of our head and out of our life. We're all wrapped up in our selfish, petty, little, twisted, sinful natures. All of us are. So we show up here so that God can make us right. We come as we are, but God doesn't let us stay as we are. None of us. He loves us too much for that. He's going to help us make sense out of this crazy world. Help us to be thankful instead of discontent. Help us to love people instead of being selfish toward them. See, by doing God's will, instead of insisting on doing the things that we've always done according to our own selfish desires, our own self-destructive tendencies, see, then we'll start using that hammer he gave us for something other than breaking everything. We've got to start seeing the world through the lens of faith in Jesus through the lens of God's word. That's the only way to understand what this life's all about, you know? Because any other way of looking at the world is going to lead to hopelessness, meaninglessness. So every week we show up here to sing a few songs, say a few prayers, hear from God's word, and share a meal while catching up with our friends. I mean, it seems pretty simple, but it's so much more than it seems. This is worshiping God. This is orienting our lives toward ultimate meaning and purpose. See, I promise, when you start your week by coming to new church, you're going to leave with more hope more joy than when you got here every time and not because of what we bring to the table not because we're some kind of cool church not because of anything we do no all of these promises they're all based on God's faithfulness based on who God is not who we are the best we can do is just point to him. Just point to Jesus and get out of the way. That's all we're trying to do. Point to Jesus and get out of the way. We're all going to worship something. And if it's not God, then it's probably going to be ourself. But worshiping ourself is a death trap. Worshiping anything other than Jesus is a death trap. That's why he came down here to save us. He's the only true religion. Jesus is the only way to be connected to God. That's why Jesus is central to everything we do around here. He's the one who brings hope. He's the one who brings meaning and purpose. He's the one who's worthy to be worshiped. That's why Jesus, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, will be worshipped and glorified every time we gather here. These are the promises of new church. Promises that I need all of you to help me live out and to spread the word. To change our culture. Will you help me do that? 
Will you help me to that? Amen. Frank at frankheart.com.